Um, just before I get started, there's one more prayer I want to pray. Um, so if, if you would just bow your heads for half a moment here. Uh, Father, there are a lot of people who are part of our church community and our community at large, and sometimes they're easy to spot because their hair is all gray <laughs> or maybe all gone. And they've lived a lot of years, and what they're experiencing right now is hard on them. They're overhearing voices that, that it's not intended to do harm, but things just being said like, well, those who are the most vulnerable, maybe they should just stay home and let us get on with our lives. Would you help them trust that they still have life too? They've worked so hard to embrace technologies to stay connected with family and friends, technologies that are new to them. Would you settle in to their lives? Would you bless them? And would you help them know beyond any shadow of doubt that you still have grand purpose, high value, good plans for their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, Pastor Jonathan mentioned to you that uh, this is kind of a, a, an earmark Sunday. We're, we're two years in, and I wanted to bring you up to speed on a, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, just in terms of financially uh, where we are in this uh, process, and this is not about bragging, nor is it about begging. It's just a measure of accountability. And so when you put together the entire cost of our project, which includes everything, all of the uh, uh, building, the construction, the materials, the labor, the insurances that we had to, to purchase for all of this, when you, uh, the cost of fundraising, the dinners that we had when we all got together and, and dared to dream big dreams and pray bold prayers. When you put it all together, the cost uh, so far to, to this point is $4.34 million. How, how many... Uh, if there's anybody here who doesn't think that sounds like a lot of money, I would like to, you to raise your hand, and then I want to meet with you right after the service, <laughs> because that, that's a really big deal. Our church family, we don't have wealthy people in our church, but we have committed people in our church family. And two years ago, they committed over 36 months $1.2 million towards this project. In the last 24 months, 817,000 of those dollars have come in, including through COVID. Can we just thank God for the faithfulness of his people? We had also, previous to ever raising a dollar, we had set aside $500,000 just by the good stewardship practices of our church council and our ministry teams set that aside so that when the day come, we wouldn't be starting from flat or a hole. We would actually have money to put in. And so we had $500,000 saved. And then out of general funds, since we began this process over the course of the last two years, we've contributed an additional $436,000. That's how we're up to uh, the amount that we are. So the, the cash infusion part of our church family is, is about $1.8 million right now without any debt up to that point. And then our mortgage on this new facility, uh, expanded facility, is $2.56 million. That brings the project to $4.3 million. Now, you're saying, well, $2.56 million, that's a lot of money. And once again, if you don't think so, I need to see you right after the service. Um, but this is what I will tell you. Um, when it came to the, the, the loan, we started months and months and months in advance, back when we were fundraising, just trying to talk to banks. I can tell you this, I don't know why, God gave us incredible favor with every bank we talked to, and they competed for our loan in ways I have no description other than the favor of God for. And when we started, interest rates have come down 35% since then. And so uh, the, the interest rate we were able to lock in is unbelievable. I never thought I would ever see an interest rate, interest rate like that 
in, uh, our, in my lifetime. And so I'm super thrilled of, uh, with that. I think it's all part of the grace of God. God wants to be generous with those who want to be generous. And he knows we're going to use this space and use ministry to serve our community and expand the community really well. So can we just thank God for all of his blessing? <laughs> Amen. So, um, by, by the way, I also want to thank you for your resolve on all of the guidelines that we have uh, for COVID. I, I know how fatiguing this is. And I know there's a lot of different opinions. And I really have to say, I've been so impressed by people who even think differently, willingness to, to go with our process. Because, our, please hear me, our goal has never been to prove we are right. Our goal has always been to prove that we care. And every Sunday, you are doing that. And it speaks volumes to our community, and I'm thrilled with that. So this morning, we're, we're launching a new series. Uh, our whole capital campaign was built around this concept, with God, there's always a next. And this is what this series is about, and it's always better. Now, I didn't say it was always easier. I didn't say it was always less complicated, but it is always better. And I'd like to refer to a passage in the book of Joshua, chapter 10. And uh, we're going to begin reading in verse 5. And it says, the five kings of the Amorites, the, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lashish, and Eglon, joined forces. And they moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. The Gibeonites sent word to Joshua in the camp of Gilgal, do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us, help us, because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with the entire army, including all the best fighting men. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. After an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. And the Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, so Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road going up to Beth Haran and cut them down all the way to uh, Azekah and uh, Makeda. And as they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Horan to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them, and more of them died from hail than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and you, moon, over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself of its enemies as it is written in the book of Jashar. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. It's an amazing story. Uh, so who's more at risk? People who make promises or people who don't make promises? Promises have the appearance of limiting our options and committing our resources. And the natural tendency of the human heart is to protect itself. And so we're reluctant to make promises that could reduce options for us. The reason this is important is because Joshua and the nation of Israel had just moved into the land and they had actually made a significant promise. When they moved in, they experienced victory at Jericho, but when they went up to the city of Ai, they had a horrible defeat. They had a rematch with Ai, and they wound up winning that rematch. But to say they're overconfident about their military capacity would be a bit of a stretch. All the surrounding nations came up with a plan. The best way to go after this invading nation of Israel is to combine our military forces together in a military alliance. And once they had done that, they were reasonably confident that they would be able to exterminate is the, uh, Israel, the Israelites. And, uh, and so there was a, a the city, it, it's called Gibeon. It was just 10 miles down the road, and they came up with a really interesting strategy. They did their own math, and for whatever reason, they believed Israel was going to prevail. 
And they didn't want to be on the losing side of that, so they sent a delegation to Israel uh, to uh, enter a, a, a treaty, a peace treaty. But they knew that if Israel thought they were too close, they'd be reluctant to do that, so they, they went into this whole deception. They were afraid that they would be conquered, and so they went into this whole deception of appearing that they came from a very long way away. So they got some old donkeys to use, and then they, they picked up some moldy bread, and they scuffed up their sandals until they were almost worn out, and they tore up and, 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 and distressed their clothing a little bit. And, and they came to see Joshua, and they said, wow, when we started our journey, our bread was fresh, our wineskins were new, our donkeys were healthy, our clothes were good, just look at us. We're a, we're a mess. And, and Joshua and the elders of Israel kind of, kind of took that in. And they said, we've come from a far country, but we've heard about your big God. We're very impressed, and so are our elders, and so we would love to enter into a treaty with you. And they had a whole backstory to go along with their deception. And, uh, and so they, the Israelites asked them questions, but they never asked God any questions. And Joshua agreed to the treaty, and it was ratified by the elders of Israel. And less than 72 hours later, they discovered they'd been deceived. Um, if you've ever been deceived, you know that usually is accompanied by some very strong emotions. Very few people are deceived and just go, well, you know, okay, it doesn't matter. We don't like being lied to. So here's some strategies that people often use to get out of promises that they've made. The first is you just blame others. They weren't honest. They weren't truthful. They didn't hold up their end of the bargain. They, as soon as you can find fault with someone else, it seems like it frees you to exercise other options. Just blame someone else. Or another strategy is to blame yourself. I mean, it's just, I can't believe I'm that stupid. I'm just the worst person in the world. And here's the thing. The more we put ourselves down, the less accountable we feel. So now we're in a position where, well, I was, that was just stupid. Don't expect people to, to, to keep their promise when they were just stupid. Every time we refuse to take responsibility for something that we're dealing with, we are empowering other people to take control in our lives. You might not like what they do. And then we can blame God. I mean... In our culture, I've noticed that every time a bad thing happens, it's God's fault. And every time a good thing happens, it's somebody else's, um, the, the consequence of something someone else did. It's much easier to blame God than it is to give him credit. And blame seems to justify breaking promises. But here's the thing. It doesn't just break a promise. It breaks the future. Promise keepers assume they're going to take responsibility. And blame is just another way to avoid responsibility. So Israel, when they heard this, they chose not to strike back. Uh, they decided that they would honor the promise that they made, and not just the letter of the, of the promise, but actually the spirit of it as well. Gibeon admitted the deception was driven by fear. We were so afraid of you that this is why we did what we did. Fear is actually at the root of a lot of lies, most lies, to be honest. And Israel decided, though, that fear wasn't going to determine their response to Gibeon. Here's a good question. You should try this every once in a while. So be prepared for the thoughts that follow it. Just ask yourself, if I was not afraid, what would I do? If I was not afraid, what would I do? Well, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, Eglon, they, they banded together in a military alliance. And they decided that Gibeon forming an alliance with Israel was not acceptable because if other nations started doing that in the land of Canaan, then they, they were not going to survive that experience. And so they were going to make an example out of Gibeon. So they attacked it. The leaders of Gibeon sent word out to Joshua right away, saying, we entered a treaty. Can you help us? Can you save us? 
And Joshua had agreed not to kill them, but he didn't necessarily agree that he would rescue them or save them. And, and here's the interesting thing. He could have misinterpreted the attack against Gibeon as the judgment of God for having been deceptive. They're just getting what they deserve. No. We should always be very suspicious when something that's happening to someone we don't like, we credit as the judgment of God. Maybe it's just an excuse for our judgment being released in someone else's life. So Joshua decided to honor the spirit of the covenant. And, uh, and so he and the army of Israel, they march all night long. It's 10 miles. They don't have fast-moving vehicles to get them there quickly. The five kings were completely unprepared and, uh, uh, for this military intervention, and they were defeated. So... I talked about three things you can do that are excuses to break promises. Let me talk about what happens when you keep your promise. And the first is, it gives God a chance to give victory. It gives God a chance to give victory. Not only did Israel prevail in the coalition of the five armies that they were up against, but they would go on to rack up another 31 military conflict victories as they invaded the promised land. Victory is possible when we face our challenges and our commitments rather than running from them. The second thing is when we keep our promises, it makes room. It makes room for miracles. And this is a miracle that's really, it's impossible to explain. And quite honestly, a lot of people consider it laughable. But I can start by telling you this. It will never take a miracle to break a promise. Sometimes it takes a miracle to keep one. It just opens the door for a miracle. If, the truth is, is that we say we want miracles, but that what we prefer is a life that miracles are not required. So everything's good. All the bills are paid. Everyone's healthy. Nothing's out of bounds. Nothing's broken. That's the life we want. And yet we say we want miracles. Well... The miracles of God are not meant to make life easy for us. They're meant to make us brave and strong. That's a very different thing. So they're in this battle. I think this is a really important thing. In fact, uh, when I was praying this morning, heading into this talk, God really dealt with me on this issue, on this point. In order to have victory, they needed more time. The sun was going down, and in the ancient world, you couldn't battle at night. Not a possibility. No night vision goggles. The terrain is unknown and uneven. It's just not a possibility. And Joshua looked up into the sky, and he commanded the sun to stand still, and he commanded the moon to stand still, and they did. Now, this is where people go, that's what I don't like about the Bible. I mean, it's so old and superstitious. I mean, after all, we all know now that the sun doesn't revolve around the earth. The earth revolves around the sun. Look how silly and, and naive that is. And, and before we get too happy about that kind of thinking, let me just ask you, what do we refer to it when the sun is starting to be seen in the morning? We call it sun Oh, like the sun is coming up. Nobody says, oh, look at that. The earth is revolving to greater lightness. Nobody does. That was the most beautiful earth revolving to greater lightness I have ever seen. No, they, they take a picture of it. They label it, earth revolving to, no, they just call sunrise. Same with sunset. We call it sunrise and sunset. I don't know what happened that day. I cannot explain how God did what he did. I often can't explain how God does what he does. But will you only trust a God who can do what you expect and what you can explain? It's quite a limiting thing. And keeping your promises increases the option for authority. Israel was no longer acting like a nation of previous slaves. They were taking on the responsibilities of a prevailing nation in a region. Authority is the ability to step into uncertain situations. 
and believe that you have something to offer, that you can actually make a difference. God actually entered a covenant with humanity. We all violated the provisions of that covenant, every one of us. We've all acted in deception. We've all failed to keep our commitments. And he didn't use that as an excuse to break his promise to us. He sends his son who gives his life and a new promise. Every fault, every failure can be forgiven. No exceptions. And I will always be with you. God didn't blame. God didn't use our deception and our weakness as an excuse. He faced the enemies of sin and death on our behalf. And as a result, for Israel, the next victory for them was just 10 miles down the road. How close is your next victory? If you're just willing to keep your promises. It's not a call to make unwise decisions. We should inquire of the Lord. We should pay attention to red flags. But I can promise you this. You will not make perfect decisions all of your life. And when you don't, is that an excuse to not keep your word? You cannot have a life that matters without saying words that matter. You cannot have a life that matters without saying words that matter. So Calvary Assembly made a commitment, not just to our church family, but our community. We were going to expand our facility so that we have more space for people to experience more grace. And quite honestly, when COVID hit, we had opportunity to scale back or bail out of that. It was, it was a really challenging, we, nobody knew. We didn't know what was gonna happen. We didn't know how long it was gonna take. We still don't know how long it's gonna take. But we decided, we made a promise. We're gonna keep the promise. And what I can tell you is there's some things that were really interesting, interesting in timing. They shut down construction. We were not considered an essential project. And the folks that were working on the expanding our facility, that they, they couldn't do anything. The very few people that were left, they literally, on the day, on the day, they were packing up their tools and they said, we can't be here anymore. On the day they were packing up the tools, we got an email from the governor's office. We considered Calvary Assembly's project to be essential. <laughs> and they didn't get off the property. They unpacked their tools. Kids' ministry space. Because we were closed down, we decided to go all in with that. And as a result, we actually completed that project ahead of time. And the interest rates. I told you, we saved over 35% of what interest rates were just a few months ago. Um, my wife and I made, my goal heading into this was to be the most generous I'd ever been in my life. And when COVID hit, all of our futures became uncertain. And many of you are not aware, I actually also had another position with our denomination and uh, worked two days a week in Syracuse for that. And I decided not to allow my name to stand for re-election. And so that would impact our family financially. And so that was a time when we could have said, we need to revisit the commitment that we made. And we just decided we would keep our word and give God an opportunity to give victory, to perform miracles, and to grant even greater authority. And he has done all of that because God is faithful. God is faithful. Would you say that with me? God is faithful. Even when we're not, God is faithful. Let's bow our heads this morning. I don't know if you have backed out of commitments and what they are. And this is not a message about making you feel guilty. You, you can't rewrite history. But you can start making a different set of decisions. Trying to navigate life without making any promises, it doesn't make you more honest. Well, I'm not gonna make a promise I can't keep. The reason people live like that is they don't wanna be responsible, which is the exact same reason people break their promises. 
I'm not asking that you would consider making unwise promises. There's going to be times in your life when you need to tie yourself to something that's other than you, possibly bigger than you, and further away than you can see right now. And with your words, you're not just limiting and committing. You're opening heaven to what God might want to do in your life. So Heavenly Father, help us be brave and bold, not only in our willingness to make promises, but to keep them. And in those moments when it's far beyond us, help us to look to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together this morning.